to welcome you on behalf of the World Affairs Council of America. I'm Charles Shapiro, President of World Affairs Council of Atlanta. Uh, Bill Clifford, the CEO of the Umbrella Organization, is joining us today, but he asked me to host this transatlantic conversation on putting people first in digital government services. I want to give a special welcome to Joni Smith, the representative of Scotland and the British Embassy in Washington. Um, and also, I want to thank Andrew Staunton, the Consul General of the UK in the Southeastern US. Andrew was helpful in putting us in touch with the people in the government of Scotland. Um, at about 12, I don't know, 1240 or so, in 40 minutes, we'll take questions from the audience. Please submit them using the Q&A function on the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And do me a favor as the person who has to read the questions, keep the questions short and use your name. And thanks to AWS, Colleen Cox is going to draw illustrations of today's program. Colleen is sharing her whiteboard so you can see the illustrations as she's drawing them. Joni, I, I want to ask you to say a few words on behalf of the government of Scotland. So we're going to, I'm going to turn this over, over to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Shapiro, for that, for that kind introduction. And as the Ambassador has said, I'm Joni Smith and I'm the Scottish Affairs Councillor or in non-diplomatic money, the head of the Scottish government team based at the British Embassy in Washington, DC. And I'd like to begin by formally welcoming you all to today's event. Um, I'd like to extend my thanks to um, Ambassador Shapiro and the World Affairs Council of Atlanta for hosting us here today and um, bringing everyone together um, to discuss such a, a wonderful topic. I'd also like to um, acknowledge the Consul General in Atlanta, the UK Consul General in Atlanta, Andrew Staunton, who I know has um, joined us on the line and was instrumental in um, joining us up with the World Affairs Council. So we are we are grateful for, for that partnership being made. It's not required, but for those of you that know him, he is, of course, another fine representative of um, Scotland. So uh, we appreciate his partnership. As Scottish Affairs Councillor, my role is to showcase Scotland across the US as the best place to live, work, study, invest and visit. And on all of this, particularly in the US, we're, we're starting from a very strong baseline from our shared heritage to, to modern day partnerships. The ties between Scotland and America are deep and enduring. America remains Scotland's biggest customer um, for our exports and our biggest source of foreign direct investment. You are also our second biggest supplier of international tourists and international students who study at some of our globally renowned higher education institutions. And we're delighted to be able to participate in events such as this one today that show that those ties continue to grow through the sharing of best practice from both sides of the Atlantic and cutting edge partnerships, including with Amazon Web Services and IBM Watson Health, which we will obviously hear more about as we move through today's session. I won't steal Jonathan's best lines, but safe to say that um, Scotland has made significant progress on digital transformation as part of our national digital health and care strategy. And the move to cloud and digital technology has been a key part of that journey. The move to digital has been accelerated during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'd like to take a moment, obviously, just to acknowledge the tireless work of all of those involved in delivering health and care services during this time. Citizen engagement and person-centered care delivered through new digital tools and systems have been vital and are continuing to provide a platform for improving health and care outcomes for all. Once again, uh, a big thank you for joining us here today and a huge welcome from me. I am sure you, like me, are looking forward to a very interesting and insightful discussion. I'll now hand back to Charles to begin the official panel session. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate that. Our moderator today is Dr. Laura Dawson. Laura is the principal program manager for North America of Amazon, the Amazon Web Services Institute. Laura's going to introduce the panel, and I'm going to mute my camera. So I'm going to turn this over, over to you, Laura. 
Thank you, Ambassador Shapiro. And thank you to everyone who's joining us. Uh, hopefully you've all figured out the, uh, the uh, animation and the screens and you've got a view that you like. Um, I am just delighted to be here today because what we at the Amazon Web Services Institute does do um, is uh, talk to government officials, public sector about things that are, are really cool in digital modernization, in tech opportunities. And in addition to the things that are really cool, we are also talk to them about things that are challenges and things that are pain points and how they can work together and how they can work with us industry to, uh, to manage those challenges and help to deliver the best possible government services to your, to your citizens and to your users. And so being able to put this program together that includes industry uh, as well as government representatives and has the added benefit of a transatlantic conversation between two scrappy, aggressive digital leaders, Rhode Island and Scotland, is, is a really terrific opportunity. I mean, I, I don't have to tell you about the chat challenges that happened overnight when we were all affected with the global pandemic. Um, before the pandemic, we used digital services, government services online from time to time. It was convenient, it was easy, but we always had, almost always had an option to get our services in person. Uh, then the pandemic hits and we have to get these services um, uh, online. Moreover, the services that we need expand exponentially. So health services, employment services, uh, education for our children and family, all of a sudden we are all glued to our devices. Um, government service providers were also forced to shift into hyperdrive at that point. Some of them were well advanced in terms of having their infrastructure and online service delivery programs that they needed but others had insufficient capacity to handle the loads. They had meant to update at a later date. Someday they were gonna get rid of that out of date equipment, um, but they never got around to it. And all of a sudden they are stuck with this crisis and this demand to manage it overnight. From the user perspective, if you're a person who is tech savvy, and had access to good equipment and connectivity. The shift to going 100% online was daunting, but it was probably manageable. But what if you're on the other side of the digital divide? What if you're a senior citizen who isn't used to this stuff? What if English uh, is your second language? What if you uh, have some disabilities? You lack the equipment, you lack the know-how, you lack the skills. Accessing these services then become impossible for you. And so we are talking to folks today who have been working diligently to help get those services to all people who need them, not just the ones who have the best equipment and the best technological ability. Um, so we're going to be talking to our panel about their digital modernization journey and how they managed to provide services that were accessible, user-friendly, and what lessons they have uh, for the future. So joining me today from the government side, I have Abby McQuaid, who is Senior Advisor and Chief Innovation Officer for the Rhode Island Department of Labor and Training. Her government counterpart across the Atlantic is Jonathan Cameron, the Interim Director of, digital, of the Digital Health and Care Directorate for the Scottish Government. And then on the private sector side, we have Amy Wyckoff uh, from uh, IBM Watson Health, the Government Health and Human Services and Stuart Bensky uh, from AWS State and Local Government, Healthcare and Life Sciences. I've already messed up three titles and two organizations, so please do check the uh, bios that are included uh, in the chat box and also in your registration materials because these are great people and great to get to know. So let's get started. Um, I wanna talk, first of all, at a general level about some of the impressions and responses that these governments and private sector representatives had to the pandemic. Uh, so impressions of pandemic effects on government services and digital modernization. And uh, to give you a heads up, I'm gonna start talking with Abby and Jonathan with that. So I'm gonna start with the government representatives first, and then I'm gonna ask our industry representatives to weigh in. And I'm gonna start with Abby, because Abby, you described to me uh, an amazing, daunting situation in Rhode Island 
where the applications that you were receiving for employment services were multiple orders of magnitude higher than you had ever experienced on, on your you know, uh, busiest day. So can you uh, walk us through what it was like for you in those early days and what were your, uh, you know, uh, where you started and, and what you tried to do? Sure, um, happy to. Before I kind of launch into um, our journey, I think I should introduce the department. Um, so the Department of Labor and Training is here to help Rhode Islanders succeed in the Rhode Island economy and in the national economy. And this takes a variety of forms. We partner with businesses um, and provide demand-driven workforce training. Um, we enforce labor law here in the state of Rhode Island, both federal and um, and state. Uh, we work with the federal government, the press, and the general public, um, you know, to inform everybody about the state of Rhode Island's economy. We provide up-to-date labor market information. Um, and, you know, I think that during the pandemic, uh, obviously, you know, the part of our mission that dedicates uh, the department to taking care of Rhode Islanders when they find themselves out of work, um, that obviously came to the forefront. Um, prior to the pandemic, uh, Rhode Island was experiencing um, a record low <laughs> in unemployment. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, during the pandemic, you know, based on shutdowns, et cetera, we, um, we experienced a, like you said, Laura, a, a record increase. Um, historically, we and other you know, departments of labor across the country have uh, recor basically recorded the number of claims or applications for unemployment insurance um, on a weekly basis. And the height of Rhode Island's, uh, you know, unemployment claims numbers was actually in 1991 or 1992 during a local savings and loan crisis. And that was about 5,000 claims in a week. Um, the go governor declared a state of emergency on March 9th, and by March 17th, we had received in a single day, um, first 5,000 claims, then 10,000 claims, and by the time we got to St. Patrick's Day, we received 18,000 claims in a day. So that's the scale that we were looking at, and, um, you know, we realized that we needed to make some very quick pivots uh, with our technology because um, historically we have dealt with, um, as all departments of labor have, um, during times of economic prosperity in, you know, in the country, um, we've historically dealt with a little bit of underfunding at the federal level. Um, and so there hadn't been an investment in technology for unemployment insurance in, I hesitate to say this, but I'm going to decades <laughs> for a significant investment. Um, and so we were dealing with a situation where we were getting tens of thousands of applications for insurance um, on a daily basis. We had antiquated, creaky technology that um, could not handle those applications. And then we had a couple of, of further complicating factors, um, one being the creation of a variety of federal programs meant to help um, folks in the economy who otherwise would not, could not be helped by traditional unemployment insurance through the CARES Act. Um, and, uh, and also the fact that um, as part of the unemployment insurance program, um, basically people have to request their benefits on a weekly basis. And um, receiving, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 claims in a day, all of those people have to request their benefits every single week. Essentially, it's like a timesheet um, where, you know, the worker tells the state, I remained unemployed last week um, and therefore I'm in need of benefits. Um, it's called certification. And our certification system um, 
was a live connection into that creaky antiquated uh, technology. And it could handle at the time 72 concurrent connections um, via the, uh, the phone, because some folks do still certify um, through the phone. Um, and it could handle 375 concurrent connections um, on the web. And uh, when you're talking about 50,000 people and then 60, then 70, up to like 200,000 people, they're not all going to be able to get through to request their benefits. So we had new programs, we had um, an onslaught of people essentially trying to contact the department to provide us with the information we needed to release their benefits to them. Um, and we had extraordinarily old technology that we were working with. Um, and uh, that was kind of, that was, that's the context for our, our, our journey into the cloud and into modernization. Um, so what did you do? <laughs> oh gosh, well, um, we very quickly um, reached out to a nonprofit agency that we had worked with um, to perform some ROI calculations and to do some, some research um, on our demand-driven workforce um, solutions program called Real Jobs Rhode Island. And um, that nonprofit research improving people's lives um, has a, had, still has a relationship with, with Amazon Web Services. And um, in talking to that nonprofit to see, you know, whether or not there was any kind of rapid modernization that we could, you know, implement to be able to handle these applications for, for new programs that our system was not set up to, to handle. Um, and could, you know, if there was some modernization that we could perform very, very quickly um, on our uh, certification system. And, um, you know, we were put in touch with Stuart and the team at, at AWS, um, it, you know, and I have to say, we couldn't have asked for a better partner throughout this time. Um, the, the AWS team sprang into action and um, started working with us immediately upon our request. Um, and so we were able to stand up um, with AWS's help a, and research improving people's lives help um, a new application for you know, one of those programs, one of those federal programs meant to provide benefits to folks who are you know, part of the gig economy um, and to self-employed individuals. That application was stood up in 10 days and it wasn't just the front end. We also had to figure out how to force that information that we took in the form of a claim um, into our old system so that it could be processed so these folks could certify and could ask for benefits. Um, we were able to do that in 10 days and uh, Rhode Island was the first state in the country to both offer the application for um, pandemic unemployment assistance um, or PUA uh, benefits and we were also the first state to pay those benefits. Um, we did it weeks ahead of other states, not that it's a competition, but weeks ahead of other states, um, you know, we were able to help our citizenry uh, in a way that without, you know, without moving to, to scalable cloud-based solutions, we would not have been able to, to do. Um, with regard to the certification system, we continued to work with AWS and once again, you know, in a 10 day, you know, a truncated sprint, right, a 10 day time frame, we were able to completely replace our certification system um, with a cloud based certification system. So no longer analog, no, no longer direct connections into our, our antiquated AS400 box. Um, instead, we had a cloud based solution that, um, like I said, we stood up in 10 days. And um, whereas we were previously only able to take about 40,000 certifications in the course of a given week with 
that analog technology, um, we were able to take on the first Sunday after we launched our new certification system, 85,000 certification requests. Wow, wow, yeah. that is awesome. I, I'm going to stop you there, Amy, because I want to, uh, Abby, because I want to get back into, uh, we'll get back into some of the other uh, great accomplishments of, of Rhode Island. You are you're an amazing example. Those 10 days must have been just uh, uh, pandemonium. Um, but I want to I move on to, to Jonathan and uh, talk about some of the experiences that you had because Scotland's, uh, the Scottish Government uh, authority to provide government services was relatively new. You're ticking along, you're working with IBM, you're doing great stuff. And then the global pandemic hit. So how did you manage? What, what did you do? Uh, thanks so much, Laura, and uh, great to be here. Um, I, I think the first thing to acknowledge was just how daunting it was. So, it, um, so I very much lead the health and and care IT response. Um, and I think the biggest challenge we had was just to acknowledge completely new disease, no information, and the, the need to set up services very quickly. Um, so particularly around testing, but also things like contact tracing, and then later on towards vaccination. Um, and I would probably categorize it as we had to bring IT and, and that work out the back office into the front line. And overnight, digital became the thing that everyone wanted to talk about. And overnight, particularly struck by you know, our citizens and the people of Scotland being really interested in data and being really interested in health and how everything was, was, was going, you know, how many tests were being carried out, how many vaccinations have been done today. So it's been really striking. Not only did we have to respond really quickly, but we, we had this real interest and, and demand and drive for data that we didn't have before. Um, so, so the appetite to use digital tools was, was something actually as an opportunity we've, we've had to take on. Um, so I would categorize our response overall as, as, as very agile. Uh, and and you know, prior to COVID coming in, there was that sense of, yeah, we've got a bit of time and, you know, there's no end date for this or, um, you know, we need to do more engagement and things would kind of drift. We didn't have that. So it was like, as, just as Abby has described, you're turning around things in days uh, and that, that mindset, that culture, um, it's, it's, it's just that we, we don't want to let go of that now. You know, that's been the big sea change that, that, that COVID has brought for us. We'd also acknowledge the support we've had from, from lots of different partners um, in Scotland. So we have responsibility for our, for our own health service and also our care service. Um, and, and so we've been working with, you know, the digital teams at the front line to make sure they had the right tools and, and, and the right approach for, for a number of different things in our COVID response. Um, I think what we've also seen is just a greater desire to work together to standardize. Um, and we've particularly seen that on a global scale now with what's required for um, vaccine passports or COVID certification. Um, and so, you know, looking ahead to the future as well, what COVID's brought is a, a greater desire to work across um, international standards and to say, if we're going to work together on this, we need to, you know, we need to be working on the, in the same way on, on the same things. So, so for us, it's actually been a, a real opportunity to, to, to standardize and, and make sure we're using um, new technologies like cloud in, 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 in a way that will help interoperability challenges and, and help get away from the customization and the, the sense of, you know, particular areas needing their own thing. Um, so it's been a tremendous experience. I actually joined the Scottish government literally three months before the pandemic started. Uh, <laughs> so actually learning how to be in government was new to me. And then of course, overnight, we all shifted to, to virtual meetings and virtual things. So the great many of my colleagues I've, I've still never met uh in person so it's, it's i think the the shift in culture to being virtual uh, and to using tools collaborative tools you know across our own staff our own teams but across you know a huge network of people has, has, has also been really striking uh and, and i think people generally have embraced it but i think it's only become on to that you know we are also aware of sectors of society and groups that don't have access to digital tools and, and bridging that digital divide is, is, is still an ongoing challenge for us as we continue to respond to COVID and try and reach out to make sure that people are vaccinated and so on. Um, sure. I'll pause there. I appreciate there's, there's yeah, a lot we still want to cover, uh, but, yeah, but that, it just and, and I, I pace get, and scale. Yeah, so exciting. And, 
Yes, and I want to get back to the uh, you know digital inclusion element because putting people at the center is, is the, our main uh, focus for today. But thank you for that, that, Jonathan. Aren't we lucky that they hired you three months before the, the mm -hmm. pandemic? Um, I, I want to turn the same question slightly adjusted to uh, Amy from IBM and Stuart from AWS. Um, if you can talk just a little bit about how your organizations support governments looking for digital modernization, um, and then whether or not what you've heard from uh, Abby and from Jonathan lines up with what you're hearing from other governments. Um, are these familiar stories to you? And I'll start with Amy from IBM. All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm Amy Wyckoff, and as, as mentioned, and within Watson Health, what we do in partnership with AWS is we work with government agencies across the globe to modernize their social program, um, their social program architecture. And one of the things that you hear in the stories uh, today you know, by both Abby and Jonathan is COVID was very much not just a health crisis, but also a social crisis. And if you really are looking at putting your people first, it requires having an agile application architecture that allows you to quickly create new programs, um, identify, you know, COVID, brought to light the, a gap in the, in the unemployment approach for or the gig economy. It brought to um, forward you know, gaps that governments had in terms of um, various populations that were suddenly out of work that nobody would have thought of targeting in the past. Um, and it really raised the challenges that we've had in the past by delaying and deferring you know, technology modernizations, deferring that mobile front end, deferring the investments required to modernize the whole back end of, of government agencies. And one of the benefits um, that, that I saw within COVID, and, and you, you see the energy and you see the, the, um, the, you know, the momentum here on the call, is that governments had to act. And one of the things about civil servants is um, they're so passionate about um, put, putting the needs of the citizens first and, and being given that opportunity to rise and shine and, and showcase what government really can be that safety net for, for agencies. And so, you know, throughout the pandemic, you know, our organization, uh, we work with, you know, 18 different countries delivering social benefits um, in 970 different types of social benefits. And it was truly inspiring uh, to see the work that our customers were doing on a day in and day out basis and how they were able to you know, to cut through all the, the challenges and bureaucracy of government to really just focus on the needs of the citizen front and center. Great. Uh, Stuart, um, if you want to comment about how you support governments and uh, whether or not what you've heard uh, lines up with what you've been hearing from some of your other government colleagues. Sure. So let me just build on what uh, Amy said around at AWS, the core of what we do is really helping clients innovate rapidly at scale. That is not just an AWS thing, that is an Amazon thing. Um, so we have all kinds of what we call mechanisms that help drive that approach to um, rapid innovation at, at scale. One of the things we did with Rhode Island, once we were uh, able to take a quick breath <laughs> last, uh, last summer, is um, we held what we call a working backwards session, which was our first virtual working backwards session where we got uh, folks from Rhode Island Department of Labor and Training to um, using a structured process sort of think through what are the key pain points, who their key clients are, what are the key pain points those clients are facing and, and where they may be able to help address those pain points. We were completely technology agnostic. Technology may or may not have been part of the challenge, but from that actually came a specific solution that we're working with uh, Rhode Island to implement soon. Um, which I'll let Abby talk about if, the, if time allows. But um, the net of that is, uh, you know, working to help uh, uh, clients, and particularly in my case, uh, human services and labor clients, innovate quickly is critical what to, to what we do. And then with Rhode Island DLT specifically, I think there were a handful of things I'd like to call out uh, that I think DLT did that were critical to the success we've had. First of all. DLT leadership uh, at the time made a critical decision early on, which is recognizing that they were not going to be able to staff their way out of the problem they faced. Abby mentioned the 
sort of underfunding and technology that's lasted for decades, et cetera. But at the end of the day, um, you know, these systems tended to rely on large, uh, all kinds of sort of manual processes, et cetera. And that could work when times were good and claim volume was low, but completely collapsed when came, claim volume was high. Um, and I think DLT recognized we can't just go in and bring an army of, of untrained people to help here. That's uh, not helpful, actually. They can't help answer questions. They can't move claims forward. It'll be a hindrance, not a help. So they immediately decided that the key to this is to leverage technology to actually help people. I think a second key decision, uh, or maybe not even decision, but sort of a design principle that uh, was sort of, I think, reiterated in um, our team really, uh, I think both the DLT team and the AWS team really absorbed was that if you're applying for unemployment insurance, you're already having a bad day and there's nothing about that process that should make that day worse. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things when we look back, particularly in the US around unemployment insurance specifically, but I imagine our Scottish colleagues may have had a similar issue was uh, that process was uh, really uh, anxiety ridden for people who were applying for unemployment insurance. Either they weren't confident that their claim was uh, accepted or they didn't know what the status of their claim was or when or whether they would get paid. That led to all kinds of calls to the call center, et cetera. So it became sort of a mantra for us, like, you know, let's make life better for the claimants. It should not be a worse day because they came and we should be adding to their anxiety uh, because they've applied for unemployment insurance. And then the third design principle, I think that DLT embraced, maybe not even explicitly, so I have a, you'll correct me if I'm wrong here, was, was sort of not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? It really was, and if you think we didn't have a, initially a, a roadmap of enhancements that we wanted to make over the next five or six months. It was, how can we, we have a pain point, how can we solve this pain point quickly and effectively so that we can move on to the next pain point to solve quickly and effectively? Uh, and I think that was the ethos that drove the overall engagement with Rhode Island, I think, continues today. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, you've, you've opened up that, uh, that field of questioning really well for us, uh, uh, Stuart, uh, in some of the design principles and considerations for making online services uh, uh, consumer or customer friendly. Uh, but I wanted to actually still pick on you for a minute. Just uh, you said something interesting in our, our pre-call uh, when you were mentioning uh, that oftentimes we, de we design online services not for the users, but in order order to meet compliance and other uh, um, other obligations. Can you elaborate on, on that just a little bit more? Uh, sure. And I think what we look at, uh, it's not unique to unemployment insurance, but often there are you know, regulations and policies that are obviously are guiding particularly eligibility type programs. They're important, but they end up driving the design principles. So even, even something as relatively simple as uh, the language that is used to explain a requirement for a claimant, right? Um, in, the in the context of uh, uh, um, uh, unemployment insurance, and Abby can talk to this far more eloquently than I can, but the, the idea to explain to a claimant, well, no, you here's your benefit year end, and here's why this is a particular important date, but this um, isn't, it gets very, very complicated for folks, particularly if you're not already, if it's for your first time through that program, right? You, you have not had, you've had the good fortune of not having to apply for unemployment insurance in the past. Um, so I think that was one of the key things, right? Was to, to make people, people feel supported means that they have to understand, here's where the, here's what they're asking of me. Here's what the process happen, what happens once I provide all that information. Here's how I'm gonna know uh, where my claim or my application stands. And then at some point I'm gonna know, uh, you know whether I'm gonna get paid, if so, how much and when. Uh, none of that uh, was sort of uh, part of the process uh, 15 months ago, right? Um, Abby, you correct me if you disagree. And I think that's the goal that not only Rhode Island, but I think more broadly uh, health and human services agencies should get to and want to get to. Yeah, and that's a great segue. Let's go right back to Abby. And can you talk about some of your lessons learned uh, and principles, uh, user-centered design? Sure. Um, so, you know, Stuart is a thousand percent correct that um, often the technology that, you know, government uses that is either 
you know, custom designed for government or, you know, is off the shelf um, is meant to kind of structure a program rather than explain a program. And um, as such, it kind of creates this cyclical pattern where the, you know, compliance informs the technology and the technology informs the policies that implement, right, the decision. And, and so it's this, this constant cycle um, where the technology, you know, kind of is trying to catch up to the policy. The policy is basically trying to figure out how to use the technology. And as time goes on, that becomes harder and harder and harder. And so, you know, um, one of the things that, that we in, in Rhode Island, um, you know, learned and, and learned early on um, was that really you can use technology as a, as a wedge. And what you can do with it is you can actually use modern technology, um, use, you know, cloud-based services in our case, um, to essentially stop that cycle and address some of the longstanding policies that perhaps made, uh, you know, programs opaque, if not a black box, um, you know, to actually implement things that um, old technology couldn't allow, but that, you know, elastic scalable services do allow um, to basically start to think about the citizenry, um, you know, not so much as a monolith, but as individual people who are interacting with the government. Um, Stuart's right, you know, unemployment is not a fun process for anybody. Um, and we at the department are, you know, interacting with people on one of the low, you know, one of their lowest days, if not the lowest point of their lives. Um, and so, you know, what we were able to do was to kind of reorient ourselves, our policies, how we were going to interact with, with the citizenry. Um, and we were only able to do that because we embraced um, cloud-based services, because we embraced modernization. Um, that's, a, that's a really great point. I want to go back to that you just made, Abby, that, that uh, digital modernization does not necessarily have to be the wedge. I think you used the word wedge between the haves and the have nots, the savvy, the not savvy, et cetera. But it can actually be a democratizing, unifying force. And I think that, that's a, a really key point. And I want to, I want to pick that up with Jonathan. Uh, I know in speaking to your team, you were quite involved in ensuring that you had the broadest base of inclusion and you were thinking about all users, not just the, uh, you know, smart young person with the gadget in his or her hand. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, we tried, we tried very much to think about, um, you know, someone in a care home trying to access a particular service or, or someone who was, was less confident in digital. I, I was struck by the compliance point that Abby made and, and maybe just had, we took the opportunity to try a different approach and led with ethics and actually said, you know, is this the right thing to do? Um, and then using that as almost the, the lever, if you like, to say, you know, design based around this being as open as it can be, as easy as it can be. Accessibility standards, again, really helped. So, you know, we, we, we started with, you know, as many people need to be able to use this tool, this process, or, or to understand what we're trying to do. Um, that was particularly helpful when we came to do proximity um, tracing, um, you know, as part of contact tracing, um, you know, a lot of concerns about privacy, a lot of concerns about you're tracking me and, and using data in the wrong way. And we're able to say, you know, ethically, we're trying to protect you. We're trying to, you know, alert to you if you have come into contact with someone with COVID. Um, so it was, it was just a different way of looking at it as a way of bringing people with you. People say, oh, I understand that now. I, I know what you're trying to achieve. Therefore, I will buy into it and use the technology and we had you know some, you know way above expectation take up of something again prior to COVID that no one would even have dreamed of we would be we'd be getting into so I think building confidence um and and and, and starting with just you know different ways of looking at the problem um but always with the user in mind so so um yes yeah, so a number of different applications 
Um, we, we always always start with the user journey. So what's the very first touch point that they will have and where, what are you trying to get them to do? So if it's to you know, book a test or, or, to, uh, or, or, to, or to simply actually access technology that maybe you know, tries to break down a very different problem. So one of the other things we saw in COVID was, was loneliness. And, and can we actually use digital tools in a different way that help bring people together and, and, and to interact in a different way? And uh, there's been some really interesting examples coming out of, of some of the barriers that previously were there, again, dealing with care homes, for example. We've actually taken this opportunity to say, right, break down that barrier so they are better engaged with the community. There, there's, there's a volunteer network that's out there that can help. So it's, so again, that opportunity that new technology brings um it's it's, it's really starting to, to to you know challenge different problems that we have great that's it i'm moving to scotland joni can i send you an application this afternoon I, i'm going <laughs> ethics and uh caring uh, this is a really a, a, a great set of examples amy you uh are actually building this stuff um, and so what are some of your main considerations when you're uh, designing user or customer centered solutions? Yeah, thank you. And, and I, I'd like to build off of, you know, what Abby and Stuart were saying about when someone goes to get unemployment, they're already having a bad day, so don't make it worse. But the other side of that is when someone's going to get unemployment, unemployment isn't the only resource that government has available to them. And so as we've been designing all of our solutions, it's really designed around the family, the citizen and the family, and giving them that front end to be able to get access to all the benefits, all the services that government can avail to them in a common user experience and a common approach. The other side is building off of you know, what Jonathan and Abby were talking about in terms of you know, the agility. And you know, we aren't, we're never going to go back to a world where we can design a system for 50 years. We are lucky if our laws and our programs can last, you know, three years, um, 18 months, you know, three months, <laughs> really, you know, with what we were seeing with COVID. And so uh, as we're designing our solutions, it's all with the, the thought process of being able to provide government agencies the agility to rapidly update and dynamically create social programs um, that need to be targeted at very you know, discrete um, portions of the population. Um, the other side of it is that partnership, you know, that it used to be that you know, there was a legislative arm and an IT arm, and then you know, the citizen was somewhere you know, trying to navigate their way to different government agencies to go get access to the benefits that they wanted. And one of the things that I've enjoyed watching over the well, I really the last three years and COVID you know, obviously um, accelerated it rapidly was that collaborative approach between the legislative branch, the business analysts, the IT staff um, implementing the solution and the, the change management um, designed to reach out to citizens and train the caseworkers that need to be operating on, on a regular basis. You know, we see examples where um, governments have those four people sitting together and as they're designing legislation, having a business analyst right there, understanding how is that gonna actually, what are the rules, what are the rates, what's required to get that in place, having someone there looking at how that could be put into the system. And then really what's the, how do you go about, you know, educating people, um, making people aware of the opportunity. I think that's one thing that Scotland's done really well over the years is um, build that, you know, build agile social program delivery. Uh, and realizing that, you know, you need to scale up, you need to scale down, you need to have a cloud-based architecture that's going to support that. But at the same time, you also need to have an application and a business model that is designed for change, is designed to put the family first, and is designed to help, you know, address the, the evolving needs of society. Yeah, um, something I learned from talking to you and your team is that when if, if I were to go into design with absolutely no skills, I would bring all my biases with me. I would say, well, it's relatively easy to upload your documents, uh, family situation, mother, father, two kids, that's relatively easy. Um, in talking to your team, uh, you, you highlight things like what if you have to, you know, it's difficult for you to get your documents to where they need to be, or if you have a complicated family situation, how do you think through those things so that you're 
you know, uh, accessible to all families, not just the one that I think that is nuclear and easy and everybody's got a phone. Yeah, I mean, the reality is that our lives are complicated and family structure is probably one of the most complicated things that you can ever um, try to, to manage and, and family structure and how that gets defined by different programs changes as well. Uh, and so again, we always start by sitting down and, and as we design our product, we're designing it with citizens and families sitting down and understanding, you know, what are the challenges they have in going and applying for benefits and how can we give them that feedback loop that they need um, on an ongoing basis so that they know when a task is completed and when a task um, can go forward. The other side is, you know, there's also a trade-off that at times we have to look at um, as new technologies come out. Are they accessible? Are they going to be, you know, accessible, um, capable of being read on a JAWS reader for, you know, someone who's blind, blind and can't see? Um, are, you know, is it going to be able to give them the right modality to be able to support um, someone who's living in an, an, um, a, a nursing facility um, or a care facility who doesn't have a digital um, digital background. So how do you keep things simple for what can be a really complex process and a scary process of trying to apply for benefits? And that that's really you know the the um, art and the science of what we try to do within our products. Great, great. Uh, Ambassador Shapiro would like me to tell you, I'm sure, that uh, we have the question answer box open. So put your great questions in there and he's saving them up. Um, but I have at least, well, I have many more questions, but I have at least one more question uh, while I still have control of the group. Uh, and that is what advice would you give to governments who are considering digital modernization, are in the midst of digital modernization? What are the one or two top things you think they should know? Abby McQuaid. Um, so, you know, I think, and, and this is just, this is just one person's opinion, but um, I would say that um, number one, it's never too late, right? That, you know, modernization is a journey um, and it's, you know, it's something that's iterative and, um, you know, it's a process that is, is never complete. So, you know, you can jump in at any time. Um, the, you know, I would also say that, um, you know, there's a lot of fear around modernization. There's a lot of fear around modern technology, at least, you know, on the government side of things. Um, it's, it's easy to say, well, this has always worked. This is the way we've always done it. And therefore we need to continue doing it this particular way. So when I said that, you know, when I mentioned the wedge and stopping that cycle, um, you know, I think that it's, it's not just something that is, you know, it's not just a positive, it's, it's actually a necessary step, um, you know, that, that to modernize, even in the face of, of challenges like we've experienced over the past, you know, 15, 16 months, um, governments have to take that step. Um, if, if we don't, then we will, you know, not just stagnate and not just um, help our citizenry uh, the, way, the way we are meant to, um, but we will cease to function and, uh, and not just function well, but function at all, right? right? We were going to grind to a screeching halt if we did not make some, some very quick pivots. And, right. um, you know, governments that, that weren't able to do that did not succeed, um, you know, in, in helping their population the way Rhode Island did. Right. So there are critical inflection points when the status quo is just not an option. Absolutely. Jonathan Cameron, what, have, uh, what advice do you have? Um, Abby's actually said two or three that I thought were really good as well. I would say always start with the user journey. Um, I, I think if you could just, just put that focus in on the citizen, on the individual, um, it really helps you understand then what are the next steps you need to take. Um, don't be afraid to try. And I think you have to acknowledge sometimes not everything you will try will work. So I think sometimes putting your hand up to say quite early on, we've tried this process, this technology is not working. 
let's move on, let's try something else. Um, and and I think um, the, the the last thing I think is, is not to get too hung up on the, the, the compliance and the, and the legal part. Um, I, I think it can be there to support. Um, and, and I think, you know, Trying a you know a different angle to something and a different way of looking at the problem can 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 also help as well. So, um, but yeah, I think it's, it's that user at the heart of it is, is is the key point I would share. Great, great, Stuart. Of course, I would amplify everything that Jonathan and Abby said. I think uh, start now, right? Uh, Abby said it's never too late. It's also never too soon. <laughs> now's, now's the time. <laughs> Um, you don't have to boil the ocean. You can um, you can find the uh, find the pain point that you can address now. You don't have to wait, uh, you know, three years for a new system to come in order. Find the things that you can do now. Uh, incrementally modernize, wrap around what you have today that works, and then over time you can replace that. But you want to deploy you want to uh, deploy a business benefit as quickly as possible. Then iterate on that. Um, I love what Jonathan said about uh, trying stuff and experimentation. Uh, one of the things we say at Amazon is if, if you knew it would work, it wasn't really an experiment in the first place. So it really should be an experiment. You should be able to try some stuff. And I'll just add that um, the best platform platform for that kind of uh, experimentation tends to be cloud. And then the I guess I would say that the thing you want to, the overarching thing I, I think you want to have keep in mind is that you want systems that are flexible as and agile, as Amy said, that are tools that support clients and the workers who use them and that are not impediments to that work. And too often when we're working with clients in the US and elsewhere, you know, you, you wanna do something, you wanna implement new policy, you wanna try something different and your IT system is a constraint rather than an enabler of that. And all of these systems, we need to think of them as enablers, not just of today, but for potential change in the future. So that's what I would say. Great. Thank you. And Amy? Yeah, I would, I would just build off of what everybody has already said. You know, the, the pandemic was an absolute catastrophe for all of us, but it, it's also an opportunity. And it's forced um, governments to rethink how they go about delivering services. And really, my takeaway from the heroic work that I've seen our clients do across the globe has been, you, you can't be scared of replacing that, that core system. Um, it's not the safe bet to leave that legacy system in the background and just keep throwing bodies at it. The more effective approach is to look at how, how can cloud technologies, how can purpose-built um, applications allow you to change the approach for how you go about delivering social programs and, and supporting the needs of your citizens. Great, thank you. Ambassador Shapiro, we got some questions out there. We've got some great questions out here and uh, well, come on in ask them there there you go okay and i want to thank richard halstead nuslock who teaches it and wants to know if he can use a video of this the answer is yes we'll put it up in a couple of hours and you're welcome to edit it shorten it do whatever you need to make it more useful for your class um uh he asks about scaling up i mean rhode island's a small state georgia's got 11 million people florida's got i don't know 20 something million Texas, 30 million, California, 35 million people. Are there systematic outreach to the states to share and scale up these successes, he asks? And I'll well, let, that's once I answer that. Yeah. You, got, you got some scaling and you got le learning between governments. So who would like to grab that one? Um, you know, I, I can I can jump in there really quick about the, the you know, the at least within labor um, nationally, uh, the you know, US Digital Service and the Department of Labor have since the pandemic um, or since the height of the pandemic um, started working together to um, discuss success stories um, and uh, to, to talk with states about modernizing their unemployment systems because of just you know, exactly what we all experienced. And, then, and, and Jonathan, that, oh, go ahead, Amy. Yeah. As, we, as we've talked about today, that's one of the benefits of the architectures that are being deployed is it does scale up and scale down. So, you know, it can work for, you know, a smaller, a smaller city, a smaller state like Rhode Island, but then also that same architecture 
can be applied, you know, at a national level or, you know, a large state like, like Texas and California. If you have the will, the, the technology is not the deterrent there. It's, you know, it's, the tools are available. They're available now. The, um, it's more, you know, the willingness to start and make the changes that are required for the citizens. Right. And you've also got the flexibility to scale down as demand drops, or if this is an experiment that didn't quite work out, it's not catastrophic. We can roll everything back in real time and uh, not have a bunch of stuff that we no longer want to pay for. Jonathan, did you want to add? Yeah, sure. It's very much building on that scaling point. Yes, it's absolutely feasible. And it's, you know, it's, it, across the United Kingdom, we've, we've been scaling up particularly to meet testing demand. So we're dealing with, you know, tens of millions of people um, you know, requesting tests uh, or, 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 or doing COVID-related activity. And I think the other element to this is it actually also scales up interoperability and working across countries. So um, Scotland's actually leading in terms of um, sharing information across the United Kingdom. Um, and now as COVID certification comes in, we're starting to see that cloud-based technology being able to help people to travel. Uh, and then, you know, the number of transactions and as, you know, economies restart, we're going to start seeing, you know, a huge scale up and in, in people using health information in a way that we haven't seen before in order to, you know, to gain access to, you know, to different countries. So that ability to very rapidly, not only scale up, but actually to share information across boundaries is, is a huge advantage to, to cloud-based technologies in particular. Yeah, and, and that's a great point because governments don't compete. Unlike the private sector, we don't compete with each other. We share information and uh, folks like Rhode Island and Scotland, when they do really cool things, they want to be able to share their successes and some tips for, for others as well. Charles, Charles did we have... And, oh. Yeah, I've got, I've, got, I've got some questions of my own. So let me uh, jump ahead. here. So for Jonathan and Abby, what, what percentage of your the universe of your potential clients don't have access to computers, can't use the new digitalized systems, one. And two, does this give you more time for the people to answer the phones when, when people call in the old fashioned way? Uh, so I think very crudely, we're talking somewhere between about 10 to 20% um, have a, a barrier to using technology or um, don't have access to the right tools, or, or actually what I've seen more generally is a, a lack of confidence in using that. So probably anything up to about 40% of people would say that, yeah, they may have an iPad at home, but they're not very sure how to use it. So, so part of what we've been working on as well as, yeah, trying to close the gap with just simple provision of devices, but how do you put that long-term support in to, to build the confidence in using technology? Um, so what was the other part of the question, Charles? Does, 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 does upgrading your digital systems then give your staff more time to answer the phone when, for people calling the old fashioned way? Um, we've not had that experience in health, although that's partly driven by when COVID shut everything down, there's a backlog and, and we're sure. now starting to get into that backlog. So if anything right now, demand is far higher than we've ever seen it. Uh, which has in turn led to, I suppose, people just trying all different avenues. So we're, we're not seeing that corresponding reduction in demand. I suppose what we have seen in particular age groups is actually a, a, a greater willingness to engage. Um, so particularly younger generations, far more keen on using texts and, 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 um, chatbots and the like rather than picking up the phone so so it's not about reducing demand I think it's about trying to help people with the choice that they want to make about which type of technology they use and for some people the phone is absolutely the right thing to do or in fact face-to-face -face even still remains a, a good way of delivering healthcare. but but the overall demand no that's not a driver for us in terms of providing devices or, or trying to shift people away uh that's it's it, we're hoping that may come in over time but no, it's not what we're seeing right now and how about in rhode island abby um so that's a kind of an interesting question and i'm going to you know kind of admit to something which is that we don't know how you know what percentage of our population is um unable to to access um our services through the, um, you know, through the internet, basically. Um, we do know that for, you know, in our certification system, 
um, that you know, 93% of individuals who were certifying, you know, during the last 15 months were doing so um, on the web. That said, um, it's a relatively, it was a relatively simple form to fill out uh, with radio buttons. So um, one of the things that we're, that we're doing um, is we are actually rebuilding our, our claim application. And as part of that, we are surveying individuals, of course, letting them know that, you know, their answers are in no way impact their ability to get benefits, but we are surveying um, claimants to, to ask them about their comfort level with digital services, um, because that's data that we simply don't have. And so it's very difficult to decision without, you know, appropriate data. Um, in terms of, of the old fashioned way, um, you know, we're seeing something uh, certainly not on the scale that, that Scotland is experiencing, but because um, we only have a million people. But, um, you know, we, we really haven't seen um, folks back off the phones. Um, one of the things that came out of our working backwards session with AWS, though, um, was that we knew that, that sometimes people are calling um, just to get basic information. Uh, and you know, we hadn't really provided that basic information to people in an easy, easily digestible way. Um, so that's what we're, we're working on right now um, with, with AWS, uh, something that we call you know, our new UI online system. We're com completely rebuilding the front end um, the, the interface that, that the Rhode Island population uh, actually interacts with the department through. And um, part of that is the new application for, you know, to submit a claim um, where we are surveying folks on their, their digital literacy. Um, but part of it is also just simply providing basic information to people that they are very, very desperate to have, um, such as is their claim still being processed? Is it lost somewhere? Do they owe us information? Um, you know, did, did we get it in the first place? Uh, these are, are data points that the average person is desperate to have. And, um, you know, our new front end is going to provide that to them. So, you know, similar to Scotland, we are hoping that over time, um, the, you know, the, the influx of calls um, of people just trying to reach the department, you know, a human being to get some of that super basic data. We're hoping that by providing um, our citizenry with a sense of agency and the ability to self-serve that we do see a reduction in overall calls, which enables folks who have more complicated issues that require our staff's intervention um, that, you know, they're enabled to actually get through on the phones. Um, that's the long-term goal. That was one of uh, Abby's uh, great points earlier on was if we can track something as inconsequential as a pizza on its way to our home, surely there must be a way to track something as important as our employment insurance benefits. No kidding. Okay, okay. We're, al we're almost done. Got uh, a question just came in from Marquise Cabrera who asks, have you rationalized analog processes to move to digital ones? Do you have methodology or suggestions? And has that usually led to rationalizing business reference architectures? And I have no idea what any of that means. So I'm gonna hopefully. That sounds like a question for Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'll just say, first of all, hey, Marquis, how you doing? Um, <laughs> Is this uh, a setup? Yeah, no, it's not. A, uh, I, I do feel a little set up here, but uh, yeah. you know, so we have not, what, what we have not done is take sort of an end-to-end -end view about rationalizing business processes. We have actually focused on working with, you know, Abby and the team from Rhode Island, for example, on identifying pain points. I think there is a plan, Abby, you'd correct me, to have a broader sort of modernization roadmap. But mm -hmm. we were in, we, 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 we joked about it all the time, we were in crisis response mode, right? We, 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 didn't, we, didn't, we weren't thinking about, hey, what, what might this look like in nine months? It was like, hey, we have a pain point, let's solve this pain point. And then here's another pain point. And so it was really sort of lining them up and knocking them down as they came up. So um, 
I, I, I totally understand your point about having a broader view about digital innovation and rationalizing business reference architectures, but we're not, uh, we frankly did not have the time or bandwidth to do that working with the state of Rhode Island would be my answer. Amy, what about uh, Amy you? maybe she has a quick one. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, you know, obviously during a pandemic, it's not the right time to go forward and, and look at how you're going to change all your business processes and whatnot. But, uh, but what we have found is that it is, you know, when, as you are implementing new approaches to social program delivery, you have to start looking at, you know, what is the right business process? What are the right types of skills that you need around that? To the question around, you know, a, a digital front end and, you know, what, how many people have access to a digital front end? We've actually found that you, you can't talk about like a, a web page the same way as you do a responsive, um, responsive device because a lot of people don't have access to a home computer but a lot of people do have access to an iPhone or you know, you know, some sort of a smartphone. And so if you're not designing your solutions to be responsive and work on a smartphone, you're still gonna end up with a whole bunch of questions that, that happen on the backside of that. It's an opportunity as you are looking at modernization and how do you go about you know, designing new programs to also think about what's the workforce of the future going to be looking like? What types of skills do you need in your call center? Do you still need the experienced caseworkers there? Or do you need them following up on the more complex cases that, that people are calling in around? So how do you best you know, use the opportunity that you're putting in place digital technologies and modern architectures to also rethink about the best types of skills and approaches for delivering social programs to, to citizens? That's great. And Laura, with your permission, I think we're going to end there. We've uh, been at this for an hour. This is great. I've got a whole list of questions that I that, that are my questions, but I'm I'm going to call you later and get the answer to these. Um, I want to thank you very much, uh, Abby McQuaid from Rhode Island, Amy Wyckoff from IBM, and you're in Vermont. Uh, Jonathan Cameron from the government of Scotland, Stuart Vinsky uh, with AWS, Laura Dawson. You've done a Fabulous job moderating. I want to. I want to thank all of you. Um, this is. This has been really terrific. Uh, we're going to post the video of this on the World Affairs Council of Atlanta's YouTube channel in a couple of hours. Depends on YouTube, not on us. Please share it with your friends. I urge all of you to join and support your local World Affairs Council. Uh, you don't have to go to Davos or Aspen to engage in thought-provoking conversations with speakers who are leaders in their fields, like our four panelists today. If you don't have a World Affairs Council near you, we have a very economical digital membership for people who don't live in Georgia. And we've got some upcoming programs, September 20th at noon Eastern time, the border crisis from Trump to Biden with Alan Burson, former commissioner of US Customs and Border Protection. On September 22nd at 3.30 in the afternoon, charting a new course in US-China relations, conversation with the newly arrived ambassador of China to the United States, Wen Gong. And then the following morning at 10.30 AM Eastern time, we have the view from Beijing with David Rennie, the Beijing Bureau Chief of the Economist Magazine, and we'll have the interesting opportunity of matching what the ambassador says with what uh, David Rennie's seeing on the ground. I wanna thank Donna, Donna Henderson, who helped us set this up. She's the head of international engagement, technology, enabled care, and digital healthcare innovation for the government of Scotland. I wanna thank Sandra Woods, our who solved a host of problems that we had to deal with at AWS. Trina Medarev, the CEO of the World Affairs Council of Jacksonville, Florida, Laura Brower, our social media and marketing star, and Irini, the executive producer of this program. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are, to you all. This has been really a, a terrific program. I, I appreciate it, and I appreciate your giving us so much time, and I appreciate the audience joining us for this. So thank you all very much.